Today's presentation is made possible through a cooperative agreement between the Duke Margola Center for Health Policy and the FDA. Statements made today do not necessarily reflect the official agency positions or policy. Our working group members are likewise reflecting their own opinions and not necessarily the opinions of the organizations by which they're employed. Um, working group members, as you can see on the slide, we have a, um, a wonderful group of uh, senior leaders in M Health across a range of per uh, perspectives, and I want to say how excited we are to be working with this great group. Um, as you can see, we have recruited a diverse set of opinion and thought leaders in this space, and we look forward to working with these experts in M Health and in real world evidence. Um, as uh, they are primary drivers in helping us to craft recommendations for strategic next steps to improve M Health as a tool for evidence generation and evaluation going forward. Several of the working group members will be presenting on material today, starting with Greg Pappas from the FDA, Ravi um, Ramachandran from Patients Like Me, Mo Kushal from Stanford, Seth Clancy from Edwards Life Sciences, and Megan Dewar from Sage Bio Networks. Just to go over um, briefly the agenda for today, um, there's a bit of an overview of our webinar. We'll primarily be focusing on addressing stakeholder engagement, needs, and incentives. We'll also be proposing a way of putting M Health data into types of buckets to address some of the issues that differ between these different types. We'll end by going over the work group next steps and going over information about the public comment period that will follow this webinar. So with that, um, let's begin with the project scope and goal of the webinar. Um, given the level of excitement that we've seen around this particular topic, I think it's fair to say that we're at a pivotal inflection point in the availability and usability of M Health apps and wearables. This technology enables patients to take control of their own health and health care. We can see these technologies as an increasingly important source of real world data going forward. This is especially true in the context of medical devices where efficient collection of long term data is a critical component of the evaluation and surveillance. Because of this, the National Evaluation System for Health Technology, or NEST, is uniquely positioned to make use of this innovative source of real world data. As mentioned by FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb in his blog post about digital health last week, as well as uh, in, uh, be involved in the development and dissemination of analytical tools needed to transform this data into actionable knowledge. You may have seen in the Washington uh, Wall Street Journal article published uh, just today talking about cell phone based research potentially making it easier to recruit, conduct, and monitor large populations of patients for research studies. Before diving further into this topic of the day, I want to stress the importance of M Health as it relates to the broader learning healthcare system. Um, in roughly the past 10 years, We've all seen an explosive growth in both the cost and complexity of healthcare. This uh, has, has shined a spotlight on the need for real world evidence development that could inform and improve innovation, care, and value. As such, there has been a worldwide movement to include the voice of patients in medical products that are researched, developed, and marketed and used. However, many of the sources of real world data that exist today are less than optimal or don't adequately represent patient priorities or their perspectives. New innovative products uh, being introduced to the market with the ability to treat or cure medical conditions, while at the same time consumer wellness and health technology are prolifer proliferating and becoming more advanced. As these promising technologies and methods advance the vision of the learning healthcare system, we must also make sure that our policy and research institutions do as well. In this vein, Mobile Health or M Health is an excellent example of the challenges and opportunities represented by the next generation of evidence development platforms. M Health promises to further empower patients to participate in their own healthcare while confronting us with a complex big data operating environment where regulations, standards, and best practices are still being discussed. 
a key to harnessing these data to improve the lives of patients and making sure that the necessary infrastructure and incentives are in place to encourage the generation of real-world evidence from these data that can inform better care for people. Systems like NEST will be central to national efforts of linking data, people, and policies towards real-world evidence generation by leveraging strategic partnerships, critical data resources, and expert opinions to establish a more accessible and reliable infrastructure to conduct analysis, including mHealth. It is with this backdrop of these developments that we have approached the topic here today. In terms of our project scope, the project that we're talking about today will hopefully be a valuable step toward understanding the opportunities and challenges in collecting data from patients about their experiences and symptoms, as well as objective data about patients' abilities and their capacity to conduct activities of daily life. Historically, medical studies have incorporated patient-reported outcome measures and performance outcome measures as part of clinical outcome assessments. In recent years, FDA and other players in the medical ecosystem have started putting together, putting more emphasis on understanding what outcomes are of most importance to patients, as well as understanding what is meaningful change to patients. For example, um, you may have a sleeping aid that is statistically proven to allow uh, generally healthy people to sleep an extra three minutes a night. And while that might be uh, useful, uh, most people, uh, three minutes uh, would not be a, a meaningful change. Um, because of the explosion of mHealth technology, there's an opportunity to use this data to start to take novel measurements in quality of life and people's ability to conduct the activities of daily living. There are also opportunities to understand what is happening with people in between their interactions with healthcare providers. Most often, patients uh, spend most of their lives outside of the healthcare system and having ability to better collect these data during their normal uh, daily lives would be very helpful. It is easy to see how this data could be used by people and their doctors to manage their health, and there are a lot of technology companies entering this space to do so. This project is focused on if and how the data generated by these technologies designed for personal and clinical use can also be used for real-world evidence generation. As part of that, we'll need to address questions surrounding the accuracy and reliability of the data based on particular uses, best practices to keep people engaged in, in sustained longitudinal data collection, as well as efficient linking to other types of data needed for evidence development. Just want to mention that outside of the scope of what we're talking about um, it is evaluating mHealth technology as medical devices themselves. Some types of mHealth technology that produce data could be useful for medical product evaluations may be medical devices themselves, such as glucometers. Um, other mHealth technologies that reside outside of the scope of FDA's definition of a regulated medical device may also be useful, such as pedometers, Fitbits, et cetera. Our work will include recommendations around both types of technologies. With that said, we have heard m from multiple sources that companies are concerned that if their devices are used in medical research, this may cause their device to be regulated. There's a, a very nice decision tree style tool provided by the FTC that can be used to understand what FDA, FTC, or, ORC, or, or OCR laws may apply to your device. That said, I'm now going to hand things over to Christina Silcox, a research associate here at the Duke Margolis Center, for a quick synopsis of some of the work of uh, organizations like ONC and Accenture and what they've been doing on the future of mHealth and patient-generated health data and how that fits into our vision of using mHealth data for evidence generation. So with that, I'll turn things over to Christina. So ONC and Accenture um, recently released a draft framework on what they thought the patient-generated health data world would look like in 2024. And so we decided to start with their example of Christy, who's a typical 38-year-old woman. She has a history of high blood pressure. And so in between her annual exam, she used mHealth technology to track multiple aspects of her health. This allows software that she's, um, that she's given permission to to make recommendations to both her and her care team about healthy changes she could make or how to deal with sudden changes that may affect her health. But how does this software know recommend, what recommendations to make? This is where the learning healthcare system comes in. 
while the weight, steps, and blood pressure trackers collect important individual data about Christy, it can also be collected for evidence generation that allows individualized shared decision making. The same type of evidence generation can be used to continuously evaluate the benefits and risks of medical products and treatments. So in 2024, this data collection is second nature to Christy. In fact, there's a good possibility that these trackers are embedded in her clothing, home, and phone. And so she collects this data with essentially no changes in her normal routine. Despite this invisible data collection, Christy has control of who she shares this data with and what data about her can be linked. She can both authorize and revoke access at any time. And these, these types of centralized apps make recruitment and informed consent a much more efficient process. Because there is this expectation that mHealth will be able to link to these sort of centralized apps and use to provide actual information for the users, mHealth developers must provide information about the accuracy and reliability of the data coming from their devices for their target applications. And standards have been set through consumer technology associations, as well as devices that are medical devices, um, will have submitted data to FDA for clearance and approval. And this facilitates this sort of recommendation making. It is common and expected to use standardized APIs to push and pull data along with specific information about the hardware and software versions from these, uh, to and from these centralized databases based on the user permissions. And this is because the market remains fragmented due to con continued innovation. Um, raw data from accelerators, uh, gyroscopes, et cetera, are also sent so that, data, um, and so that data analysis software can use common algorithms when they're combining data from different devices. Uh, and so now I'm going to move, I'm going to pass the, our, uh, I'm going to pass the presentation along to Greg Pappas, who will talk about how this kind of information can be used to, rev uh, to leverage real world evidence. Take Greg. Greg? Thanks, uh, Greg, and um, and uh, to Christina for framing this uh, in a nice way. Uh, this is a kind of an increasing level of, of refinement, and I just want to put a little, a little bit, bit a finer point on the distinction between M Health as a mobile as a medical device, something that's regulated by the FDA. Uh, that is involved with the diagnosis, uh, uh, treatment, prognosis, and the other the, the other things that we uh, we consider to be medical devices. And there are, of course, software uh, currently, uh, and some uh, some of them that are deployed in, in apps that are already medical devices. Let's leave those aside. Uh, an important category. Uh, but what we're really fo focusing on here is how mobile apps can be used as part of evidence that can be used to evaluate medical devices and then, of course, of course medical devices of all types. Uh, the focus here, uh, obviously, is on NAS, the National Evaluation System for Health Technology. This is a emerging system for evidence generation of medical devices. We uh, are building on the reality that Increasingly, digital information is available coming out of real world, what we call real world evidence, coming out of routine clinical care that we have been using and will increasingly use in the future to evaluate devices. So, NEST is not a, uh, not a uh, device, it's not a uh, M -health, health environment, it's an evidence generation system writ large. Currently, we've been using uh, registries, EHRs, claims data in novel ways to produce evidence that, uh, can, that I think we can say now safely is better, faster, and cheaper. That's kind of my mantra for, for NEST. Uh, we're not doing um, evidence generation in NEST because it's cool. It is cool. But it's because it's, we, we believe that we can do uh, what we need to do, we need, uh, that, that is um, evaluate uh, uh, medical devices of, uh, regarding their safety and their efficacy in ways that are more efficient. In the same way, other uses the same data, if, if using the same data, other, other stakeholders can more efficiently meet other needs, help, uh, health, uh, uh, insurance companies, the payers, hospital systems, all have needs for the same data around 
the evaluation of, of devices. Now, with that said, with the focus on device evaluation and evidence, the issue um, is being raised in this uh, stream of work towards an action plan about how M Health can help or enhance medical device evaluation, can help build the uh, the nest as 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 we understand it. As, uh, and currently, we're using some M Health applications to link and augment other data systems to. Uh, evaluate the devices, and we're going to get into some of those uh, prototype examples, those those proof of concept uh, examples. Uh, and I, I think all of us that are working in device evaluation understand that standing alone, none of these data systems really can do too much. It's really uh, when they are linked with one another that the real power of of the the data uh, really um, uh, shows through. So with that. Uh, I, w I think I've uh, pretty much run out of my time, uh, and I'll turn it back to Christina to uh, move us forward. Thank you very much, Greg. This is Heather Colvin, um, and I'm the project director at Duke Margolis. And so when we initiated this project with that scope of work, the key thing that we were really interested in is, okay, well, we have this ideal vision of what we want it to look like in 2024. How do we get there from where we are now? So we have some pretty simple questions. You know, what are the different types of M Health data that are out there currently or that we envision to be out there? Um, are there things that M Health developers are already doing or could be doing um, that would make it would be reasonable in the short term that we could start using the data that's produced by these devices and technologies? Um, earlier on, um, and some of the questions that we come up with are, what are the challenges that are impeding any progress in this area? And one of the key factors that we keep coming back to is, what are the key things that make people initiate the use of a technology and sustain use of that technology over extended periods of time that would enable us to have a longitudinal look at their activities of daily living that might be incorporated um, into this broader evidence generation um, approach. Then we are looking at, so how do we then marry these two things, what's actually happening in M Health technologies out there, how we encourage people to use this technology with how these then fit with the larger research community's needs. Um, so these are the types of questions that we've been asking amongst the working group um, over the course of the last couple of months. And so we've broken down what we think the action plan will need to address. Um, we're going to be talking about a variety of these pieces on the call today. Um, a lot of this is how do we use this to contribute to world, world evidence generation, what are the types of primary issues we face in user engagement that, would, uh, uh, um, that also look at researchers' needs and the needs of different sponsors of research, and then also what are the incentives for these companies to maybe uh, adopt um, different approaches that would allow the, evidence, uh, the data that they're generating in their devices to be appropriate for this type of activity. Um, we are also intend to, over the next month or so, also include a broader set of activities that are kind of outside the scope of this project, but we think are pertinent, um, that really address some of the larger challenges um, to digital health more broadly. Some of these are, how do we appropriately address issues of informed consent? Um, it's one thing for a consumer to pick up a product and start using it, um, but how do we make sure that they are aware or um, agree to their data being used for research purposes or broader evidence generating activities? What are some of the key issues that we face in then linking the data from those devices and technologies um, to the types of registries that Greg Pappas was speaking about? And then one of the things that we hear a lot is kind of the diversity of the technology out there. What are the issues that we face when we're looking at a diverse, fragmented marketplace that is driven by innovation and constant competition and change? Those are good things, but how do we address that in terms of how we make the data appropriate for research? And then the broader issue of what do we mean by fit, by, fit for purpose? It's, it's really a kind of a case of it depends on what the data is and what it's being used for, but we wanted to have some um, broad-based discussion about what we meant for, by fit for purpose. 
However, we're not going to be able to go over all of the work we've done so far in this webinar, so we're going to focus on these key topics. Um, the recommendations for user and research engagement, identifying the different types of data types. So on the agenda today, uh, we're going to have a series of working group members presenting. Um, they're spread all over the country, so we are dealing, we're using technology to bring us all together. So you might feel a couple of glitches as we pass the buck from one presenter to the other. Um, but I think that each of these um, working group members represents a particular stakeholder group and a perspective. So right now, we're going to go into the issues around addressing the needs to build engagement more broadly. Um, we are going to have an opportunity at the end of this section. Um, we're going to have three presentations and then a, a time set aside um, for you, the participants, to give us some feedback, either in writing in the question section or we might ask you to speak up on the webinar. So thinking about what we think of as the three legs of the issues that we need to address to make this a viable pathway forward are the issues of user engagement and health company incentives and researcher and sponsor needs. To address some of the first issue of user engagement, um, we have Ravi speaking. Ravi, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. So please go ahead. Robbie, just so you know, we've had some technical issues, and we're going to need you to say next slide, and we'll just move the slides for you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Heather, and uh, thank you to the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy and the FDA for putting this panel together. I'm delighted to be on this panel working with uh, some of my colleagues in pushing this, this, what I think is a very important area of mHealth forward. And as Heather just mentioned, we are trying to address what is essentially a three-legged stool uh, around what are the issues around user, en user engagement uh, in the M health space that would not only enable people to start using the technology, but also to keep them sustained in the use of this technology. So within the scope of that, then we, we, come, up, we come to a couple of key issues. What are the characteristics of mHealth apps and wearables that actually encourage the sustained usage through time? We do not want to develop something that has a very limited shelf life. We want something that people will incorporate as part of their daily lives so that we can actually now develop the data sets that are necessary to provide actionable insights um, so, so that people can make decisions about their health and wellness. So, then, then that raises the second question, which is how do we ease this transition from being a user of mHealth into being a research participant so that people are now actively engaged in not only generating the data, but perhaps also, you know, helping analyze the data in telling us, you know, here are the things that I'm really, really interested in in my own health and wellness journey and what are the tools that I think I would need to help me get to what my health health goals are in life. So part of this process, therefore, it, be, it, become, it behooves all of us in the, in the area of mHealth to make this technology, whether it's apps or wearables, become integrated into every person's life in, in a sustainable fashion. So for that, what, what this, NTS is actually listed on this slide, with, with, so how do we cultivate, cultivate the sustainable usage, make it easy to use? So, you know, if, 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 if I'm going through life, the last thing I want to do is stop and engage with something. If it can be part of my activities or daily living, then that's great. You know, it, it's easy to use, there's low friction. How can, then the second bit is how can we get now information from the use of this apps or wearables so that it, it empowers people to, to, be, to be in charge of their own wellness? And how do we integrate this data then with clinical management and clinical information tools such that clinicians will also use this in a shared decision making? So earlier we, 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 we heard about this learning health system and what we would like to do ultimately from going from 2017 to 2024 is how do we make these mHealth tools 
part of the shared decision making so that people, we the consumers of health or M health, are not part of this process and not just consumers. So if you want to do that, then what we have to, as a group, what we think we need to do is make the design of any of these apps or wearables person-centered. So start with the end user in mind, develop these tools so that it is it encourages the sustained usage and is, and is a low friction. Then that, so once we solve that, then the other sort of issue that comes up is how do we address key issues of security and privacy? So other industries like, like banks have already done this. You know, so you, you, none of us think twice about going to an ATM or using an app on your smartphone to conduct banking transactions. And yet, we're not there with regards to our own health, which I would argue in some ways is more critical to our happiness and well-being than making sure that my $50 check is actually credited to my account. So, but to do that, we need to have people sufficiently comfortable around issues of security and privacy of their, of their data sets. And then the last bit is if you want to encourage this, this sustained user um, engagement, then we have to develop a value system. Not only a value system that is personal and meaningful to each person, which is important, but also a value system that encourages altruism, for example. How do we use this data to contribute for the greater good? Uh, and we'll get to some of these features in, in, in the next, next couple of slides. So, but if, when, we, when we as a group started thinking about this, we realized, okay, there, there are some features of mHealth apps and wearables that already make them successful. And we'll, we'll go through some of these examples in the next couple of slides. And the, 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 the third question that came up was, you know, if we, if we think through this process of evidence generation from features that are ma meant to increase and sustain user engagement and develop value for the users, are we in some ways creating a, a, a bias in the system? And how do, we, how do we address that as well? And then as a, as a group, we also want to figure out what are the recommendations by which we can bridge the transition of user to reactive research participant. And these are some of the key issues that, that this action plan that we want to develop as a group uh, will need to address. So can I have the next slide, please? So working for patients like me, um, where, uh, where I run the digital health strategy, um, real world user engagement is, is something that I live with on a daily basis. And here's a quote from one of, one of our members uh, on the Patients Like Me website, where, she, where Chris, who lives with ALS, says, without my voice, things would remain in status quo. Now that's a powerful statement from a member who, who has ALS saying, I want to be part of the system, I want to be part of the solution, because without me, the system is going to remain in status quo. And we want to have more of the crisis involved in, in our journey from 2017 to 2014. And the real question is, how do we engage and empower people like Chris to be part of the solution? And in, in, there are a couple of other quotes from this paper uh, that Megan Dorr was the lead author on in JMIR, and Megan will talk later about the types of data systems that we hope to capture, where in this study, a couple of the participants said, I very much feel like participating because I feel like I'm, I'm helping reach an overall outcome. Again, this person wants to be part of the solution and enable us to push forward. But at the same time, you also have to recognize that there are people like the, like the person in the last quote who says, I lost interest or, and or motivation and stopped recording my data for a while. So the, the real question for all of us to think about as we go in this journey from 2017 where we are now to 2024 20, is how do we engage more of the crisis and how do we create an ecosystem that people don't feel like they've lost interest or motivation but want to be part of the solution again. And that is the challenge facing all of us as we think about mHealth 
and, and, and the technologies and how they're useful in, in, in going around, going about a daily life. So if I can have the next slide, please. So we're not just going to tell you here are some of the problems and here's what we'd like to do. And what we're actually, in this slide, which I borrowed from John Raiders uh, from Thread Research, who is also part of this working group panel, is some of the ways in which we could engage user participation and, and, and empowerment in, in this journey forward. And what you see on this, on this graph is an engagement predictor tool that Thread, is, Thread Research has developed, where on, you have two axes. On the y-axis is motivation from very low motivation to very high motivation. And on the x-axis is friction from going from high friction to low friction, or low friction to high friction. So if you have on the bottom right is, is a person with very low motivation and very high friction or user engagement, which results in quotes like we saw on the previous slide saying, I stopped recording my data because I did not feel motivated enough. However, if you now move all the way across the graph to high motivation and very low friction, you have a person with a, with a very happy green smiley face, which means this person is now wanting to be part of the ecosystem and wanting to be part of the solution, a person like Chris, who says, I want my voice to be heard. I want to be a powerful resource in moving this journey forward. So then what are the motivation factors that encourage people to participate in such research? It could be the clinical benefit that they derive from, from seeing and acquiring their own data. It could be this altruism concept that we talked about, you know, being part of the greater good for society. Could it be that we could make these apps and wearables fun and engaging and enjoyable so people actually feel it as a less of a burden and more of a fun activity, whether it's for entertainment or maybe even education. You know, if, if people learn something while, while performing a daily task or activity, will that keep them more engaged? Perhaps the key factor in keeping people motivated and engaged is making sure we collect all of these data passively and add value to the daily living so that they, they not only perceive a value, but can actually realize a, a value from participating. The more we make these data collection methods active, where by the, what I mean by that is you know, having people push two or three buttons and tap on multiple screens and have them engage with these things for more than 30 minutes a day, for example, then that leads to high friction and a high burden on a person who's already engaged with work-life balance. So the more we can make these tools highly motivating with a low friction, the more value we'll realize in moving the, 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 the field from where we are to where we would like to be. So can I have the next slide, please? So then along this journey, where are we now? So where we are now is people are using a number of tools and devices and apps to collect data. Uh, I do that certainly. Uh, I have a number of tools that I use to manage my own health and, well, uh, and wellness. But then are, are the clinicians who who we all want to be part of the shared decision making and the learning health system actually using this data. So here's, here's a, a, a survey from Rajiv Leventhal at the Medical Group Management Association, which was released uh, in June earlier this year, where they surveyed over 1,100 clinicians and asked them if, you know, when patients come to you with their patient-generated health data, be it from a wearable or an app, are you using that in the shared dis clinical decision making? Only 6% are doing that. 6% out of 1,100 clinicians are currently using person-generated health data in clinical decision making. And of that 6%, a majority of, you, of the clinicians are using this information to set activity goals. So things like, well, you walk 10,000 steps this since, since I last saw you, can we now raise that to 15,000 steps till the time you come back to the, your next, next clinic visit? And even fewer of those 6% are getting data directly from the device. 
that the patient is using. So which means that 81% of the clinicians are not using any data that the patients are generating for clinical decision making. In contrast, if, we could have, if I could have the next slide please, 70% of U.S. adults in a survey done by Click Health uh, of over 1,000 U.S. adults, 70% say technology will personally help them manage and engage in their health better. And this is, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, whether you're under 20 or over 55. People view technology as a very important tool and resource in helping them stay healthy, better manage their conditions, provide care for a loved one, help them prevent sickness or disease. And interestingly, on an average, 14% want to have the physician use this data to provide an early diagnosis. And 41% of these over 1,000 U.S. adults are using mHealth technology now personally to manage their health. In the earliest slide, we saw 6% of the clinicians using this data, but 40% of the U.S. adults now are already using their devices or their apps to manage their health. So which means we have a gap. If I could have the next slide, please. And this is what we're calling the patient-generated or person-generated health data gap. 70% of the people want to use their mHealth data to manage their health. Only 6% of the clinicians are using the mHealth data in shared clinical decision-making. So there's that gap. And so part of our journey and this process moving forward is how do we solve this, bridge this gap, which means we have to do a number of things, and three of them are highlighted here. Solve for the right user needs. So are we solving for the right problem? Are we providing tools and data not and, and insight and knowledge that are helping the end user, the patients, us, all of us? We are all going to be consumers of health. Are we solving for the right user needs? Second, how do we incentivize mHealth companies who are developing these tools on and who are the second leg of this three-legged stool, how do we incentivize them to develop the right tools to solve the problems for the patient? And how do we address the sponsor of perceived clinician barriers that are preventing them from adopting these person-generated health data or mHealth data? And that's the crux of the problem. And what we'll see moving forward in this webinar is how, how is the working group thinking around what kinds of data do we need, how do we incentivize the companies, and how do we address some of these barriers to adopting person-generated health data. And with that, I'll hand over the uh, slides to the mHealth company section. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Ravi, um, and the next person up is going to be Mo Cashel. Uh, Mo, are you on the line? I am. Good morning. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. So a pleasure to be part of the working group, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time. Um, so slide 22, please. So the next couple of slides, we're going to go into more specifically some of the M Health company incentives. Um, and importantly, we're trying to think through what incentives are necessary for the companies to actually design their products to have the capability to collect and share the relevant data. Um, issues that we're thinking through are, do they already have this ability, but um, is the data kept siloed, which we've seen again and again within health technology companies? Um, and then as they iterate on these products, um, how do we just make sure this is top of mind? Going specifically into the type of data, um, we're really interested in a whole breadth of data sources, whether it's mobile apps, wearable sensors, et cetera, that, that record primary data directly from the patients. Um, and importantly, for this to be useful for researchers, the data we feel must be very well characterized in terms of accuracy and reliability. Um, and, and we're really wanting to understand, is this already being done by companies for other reasons, i.e. for internal uses? Um, next slide, please. Um, so 
what we really would love to have feedback and what we're considering is what should the action plan highlight? Um, we really want to make very specific, actionable recommendations at the end of this process um, to really promote the functionality necessary to support evidence generation and third-party usage. Um, so one big area that we're thinking through, what are the market opportunities for M Health companies to actually do this? Um, whether it's due to merging market opportunities or, or the value-based payment model change we're seeing in the US, or even novel opportunities for partnerships with payers and delivery systems. Um, so the, as we're thinking through, we're also sort of really trying to hone down what are the current challenges in supporting this functionality for evidence generation. Um, so specifics there include, um, firstly, is there a lack of interoperability and data standards to do this? Um, secondly, regulatory concerns. Um, thirdly, trade secrets. If, if a novel sensor company is collecting interesting data, uh, what are the incentives for them to actually share that? Um, and would love to again have feedback on, on how can we start to address these challenges and what, what are the highest priority challenges to address and why? Um, and, and we feel that there surely must be lessons learned from ML technology already designed primarily for the research market. So then next slide. Um, Again, given my bias towards small companies in particular, uh, we're thinking through the, the division of the land between large entities and then small, nimble startups, um, and, and do the incentives and challenges change depending with, when we're talking of those two different stakeholder groups? So going specifically into, into the large players, we feel that um, high-profile partnerships may come easier to trusted companies, um, that C-suite may already see value in working with researchers, particularly on high-profile topics. And, and, and again, just the, the incumbent large size allows them to ride through extended development timelines, they can manage risk, they have a lot more cash flow um, to think through these issues, as well as be able to leverage legal and lobbying capabilities. Conversely, the small players where, where I have a bias that a lot more of the interesting technology lives, they're definitely more nimble and innovative, However, they, they're uniformly focused on very often just one or two things, um, uh, i.e. getting initial adoption of their business model. So, so some of the considerations that we're thinking through often don't come top of mind for these entities. Um, so that's sort of the dichotomy or the, the trade-off that, that we're trying to dig into and, again, we'd love to have feedback on. Um, however, some of the incentives that we're thinking to, we, we don't think really make a, make a difference depending on size. Um, fundamentally, the market is really interested in disruptions, in my opinion, in our opinion, that can prove reductions in health care costs and ideally improve quality care as well. Um, so as long as there's a linkage and there's reliability to clinical data to generate that proof, we feel that there will be models and incentives that emerge. And, and fundamentally, we've seen this historically, again, partnerships with, with large life science companies from other entities throughout the spectrum um, does create fruitful A business models, but also value to what we're trying to define. So, Next slide, and I'll hand it back to the team. Appreciate it. Um, and next, okay, thank you so much, Mo. We really appreciate your comments. And next we have up Seth Clancy. Seth, are you on the line? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, and I just want to echo uh, the comments of Ravi and Mo, and thank Duke Margolis and the FDA for sponsoring this important work. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and represent the sponsor researcher perspective. So before I begin, I just want to qualify and acknowledge that when we're talking sponsorship here, it's really referring to any organization that's engaged in funding evidence generation with M Health technology. Those will obviously include include entities like medical device and drug manufacturers, but a whole host of other stakeholders as well that will include clinical societies, patient organizations, hospitals, employers, and the like. There's clearly a growing role for M Health in evaluating particular medical products, and as we think about those potential use cases, the first that comes to mind is regulatory decision-making, but it certainly doesn't stop there. There are many other 
uh, use cases that would include quality measurement, value-based payment models, communication directly with payer organizations and defining value, novel outcome measures, and then evidence generation that can be employed for patient-centric decision-making and shared medical decision-making, all of which are really important. In my own experience as we think about our mHealth needs, often these come up to complement other traditional assessments. So I'm in the cardiovascular space. It's very common in our clinical trials to include six-minute walk test and NYHA. Those are nice measures of functional capacity and well understood. We think about including things like activity tracking as a way to get at functional performance or how active and functional a patient is in their normal environment, not just at a point in time, but on a more continuous basis. You could also imagine examples where electronic patient reported outcomes are included or EPRO, and if you're evaluating an intervention, for an example, and you want to understand what the quality of life is continuously, not just at baseline and 30 days post-procedure, ePro and mHealth technologies really allow you to quantify that in a pretty meaningful way. We've dealt with a lot of patients that come to us and ask, after my intervention, what sort of pain am I going to experience one day, two day post-procedure? How does that compare to day seven post-procedure or day two post-procedure? While a lot of the conventional quality of life instruments include pain domains and recall windows that go back as far as two weeks, it's really helpful to be able to incorporate in mHealth technology, which allows you to evaluate these kinds of domains on a more continuous basis and really flesh out the knowledge and information that you can share and, and help quantify that for patients so that it's not just anecdotal based on the heart team's experience. I'll go to the next slide. So in terms of what the action plan should highlight and look like, you've got to start with understanding where the existing mHealth technology is today, what the strengths, weaknesses, and capabilities are of the existing apparatus that's in use. And then fortunately, there are quite a few opportunities now for improved collection and sharing on the convenience and accessibility front, the smartphone ownership is just growing and it's pretty ubiquitous among a number of diverse groups, and that's really encouraging. Certainly, if you think about the number of consumers that are wearing activity trackers currently, whether it's Garmin or Fitbit, they're already collecting information that can glean additional insights into their own health or uh, disease progression. And so from a convenience standpoint, as technology becomes more and more ubiquitous, this bodes well for being able to leverage and incorporate off-of-the-shelf solutions to help us in this regard, as well as focusing on more of those medical-grade type technologies. And all of this enables better virtual data collection, which can have the effect of reducing the time, treatment burden, and travel costs associated with patients participating in clinical trials and generating evidence. There are certainly lessons learned from other mHealth arenas and applications. If you think about clinical decision support and all the work that's gone into building that out in the electronic medical record environment, the clinical trial implementation space, there are lots of places that we can look and learn from as we attempt to get even better at the mHealth application for medical product evaluation and beyond. And then finally, there are some important points that we'll need to address and discuss with regard to data quality, specificity, validation, and methods. And in many instances, we've got to be willing to make trade-offs between high specificity and a highly validated instrument and convenience and ease of use on the part of patients. And so there are going to be circumstances where we have to decide what will be the best approach depending on our research question and outcome goals. Sometimes if you have an instrument or a technology with a one-year battery life that is very easy to use and passive for patients to engage with, that is a huge strength relative to other instruments that may be even more validated but incur 
additional burden on patients. They have to charge the device daily. They have to sync the device manually and in a regular fashion. There's not as easy access to patient cloud applications that can store that data seamlessly and easily, and so it incorporates into the patient's day-to-day -day routine. All of these considerations need to be discussed and agreed upon with regard to this general area of getting at higher data quality specification and validity while also um, preserving some semblance of ease of use, minimizing the burden on patients to the extent possible, and really focusing on convenience. I'll go to the next slide. And we talked about this earlier in the day, this idea of fit for purpose. So again, there could be a future state. Let's say we fast forward to Christie in 2024 when mHealth technologies are used for primary outcome measure assessment and regulatory approval. That's probably a, a distant part of our future at the current time point, but that does not mean that mHealth technology isn't useful and can't be used for other things. So if you animate two down, please, I'll just note that beyond primary outcome measures, mHealth can be highly useful for secondary outcome assessment, for ancillary or exploratory analysis where we're really looking at hypothesis generating or validating against other things that we know about a patient's disease state. And certainly while in the future world, we would want to think about mHealth for regulatory purposes. There are lots of applications that can be included even today with regard to post-market studies, post-market surveillance, quality assurance, quality control, and real-world comparative effectiveness research. You could also think about utilizing this kind of technology to enhance exclusion inclusion criteria for recruitment in large-scale pivotal trials and doing subgroup analysis or risk adjustment. And I'll go to the next slide. So that brings us to the concept of uh, validation, and, and certainly it's one of the biggest issues around using mHealth data for evidence generation. We really need to understand what people mean when they say validation, and we'll have to ask questions about what information needs to be provided how does that change based on the data type? What information is needed for a pain rating app versus a seizure tracker, for example? Where and when is accuracy essential versus when we can get away with some dirtier or clumsier data because it's still useful? And then finally, what information should reasonably be provided by mHealth companies and what will need to be done by the researchers themselves to push us towards a place where we all feel confident in being able to validate what we're researching and what we're communicating to the broader community. And advance one more, please. So this is my final slide, and it's just a nice example of some validation work that's already been done in the MS space with incorporating both mHealth data from accelerometers and additional clinical and health information where the attempt is to try to provide some clinically meaningful baseline change that helps us to wrap our head around the mHealth data and make sense of, of its utility. So a lot of these efforts are going on in the space, and this will continue to be an area of focus um, for us in the MS space and beyond. Certainly in the cardiovascular arena, we, we attempt to do activity tracking, crosswalk against NYHA class, and six-minute walk tests. And one of our big collective tasks as a community will be helping to define some minimum clinically important differences and then validate those differences so that we can not just generate the evidence but begin to make real good sense of it and inform that patient decision-making process. So with that, I've concluded the uh, stakeholder and researcher perspective, and now I believe I'm going to turn it back over to Greg. Okay. 
Um, great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to all of you, Ravi, Mo, and Seth, for uh, walking us through some of the working group's thoughts on, on these issues. We're now going to open up the lines to, for you know, approximately the next uh, 20 minutes or so to get uh, participants' thoughts on all of this. So all of you dialed in and listening to this, this is your chance to, um, to let us know uh, your thoughts about the, um, what we've been talking about so far. So we put out sort of three major groups uh, um, and ways to encourage uh, uh, engagement and, and uh, uh, structuring their activities in these areas. Uh, user engagement, uh, sponsor slash researcher needs, as well as the M Health company incentives themselves to stay involved and incentivized to develop uh, these kinds of uh, technologies. So we'd like to hear your thoughts. Uh, are we missing anything? Is this group uh, going in the right direction? Um, and again, you can use the um, either the raise hand feature next to your name. Um, on the webinar so that we can unmute you or you can write your comments in the chat box that you should be able to access through the button on the upper right of your screen. Um, so let me turn to... We don't have any comments just yet. No comments just yet. Okay. So what I might do is um, uh, maybe turn it back to our speakers. Are there, um, as you've heard, the other sort of <laughs> other speakers? Any thoughts or comments on uh, your what your colleagues presented, or, or um, any other uh, points that uh, you wanted to make sure got uh, raised? Joe, okay. Oh, okay, hold on one second. Let me just. We're working with technology here, so it'll be just a second. All right, I've unmuted you, Joe. Okay, Joe Drazda, do you have a comment or a question? Well, I do have a comment. I, I really appreciated this uh, discussion, and I'm glad to see uh, that this uh, work group is, uh, is is active in this area. Uh, uh, it's uh, an area that I, uh, this, it is in the whole area of obtaining patient information in a systematic way to use in clinical care of individual patients, and also in 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 research for various purposes, has been one that. We've recognized for a lot of years and just been frustrated not being able to get around to. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see this uh, this work uh, going on in, in such a thoughtful way too. I, I thought this was, uh, the presentations were great. Uh, just to kind of present conceptually what we've been thinking of, and when I say we, I, I'm sort of referring to um, a group here at, at Mercy in St. Louis where we've been uh, doing some work incorporating uh, UDI into uh, electronic health information and creating uh, 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 data that we can use for surveillance and research, but also uh, creating a means to get information on devices into the patient's clinical record for use by the clinical team. And that's where this, uh, uh, you know, this the M Health comes in and patient reporting comes in. We would really love to be able to incorporate uh, patient data right into uh, all of this, right into the patient record for use by the clinician who's caring for the patients, right into our uh, data for surveillance, et cetera. And, and our view is that uh, uh, we need to make it useful for multiple purposes in order to make it happen in a sustainable way. Uh, so that it uh, uh, has significant utility to the clinical team caring for patients as well as for the patients themselves, as, as you rightly pointed out. But, but uh, in order to make it useful, for instance, for the clinical team, we have to find a way to systematically get the data into the clinical record for review by uh, clinicians as they see patients and get it in, into the clinical record in a format that makes it easy to review. If I'm going to have to stop and look at somebody's iPhone uh, in the middle of a busy clinic and look at, you know, blood pressures for the last three months, I'm probably going to slow down and not do that. And I'm wondering if that isn't what what uh, you found when you were looking when you were asking clinicians about the use of of data from M Health. But if it's if I click on a uh, on a on a screen and all of a sudden there are all the blood pressures in graphic form and I see them in and review them all in 1.2 seconds and have additional information that helps you manage that patient's blood pressure, now you've added value. Uh, and, and I don't know that we can get that all done just talking to the M Health vendors. I think this is something that needs to be done at the uh, electronic health record level. So uh, yeah, I think yeah. there's two, two sides to this, and I just wondered uh, what people's thoughts were. 
That's great, Joe. This is Heather um, at Duke Margolis, and that is definitely the interpretability and usability of the, the information has is, is been a critical question and issue. And so thank you so much, but I think you do bring up a great place that, a point that um, it needs to be something done in partnership um, with um, the mHealth developers and the clin clinicians who might be using that. So I think we have a few more um, comments. Um, Greg? Yeah. Um, so we have a question coming in from Kathleen Bosmajan. Um, she writes, uh, how do you ensure data integrity, in particular ensuring that the, data, the actual data themselves being collected um, are actually collected from the patient of interest? So um, that is a really good question. And uh, so maybe any of, maybe Seth or you might have some thoughts on that piece? Sure, so it, it's certainly a big challenge and I'm not sure we've really tackled that yet, but there's a number of safeguards that can be put in place that again, leverage the technology that's available that help give some assurance that you're collecting um, data in, in a timely fashion and the type of data that you expect, which is directly from the patient um, when they were supposed to complete it. So, so number one, you can set up your devices in such a way where they have of pins or passwords that are required to enter, which is one way to prevent other people from entering information. Um, you also have the ability to, to track in real time when the patient is completing the assessments and put together dashboards so you know that they've done it within the specified window and that's helpful again in, in validating. When you compare it to an alternative environment, let's say you give a paper-based diary to the patient, I think you're encountering the same sort of challenges with having to um, rely on faith that the, the patient is going to complete it in the time frame that they've specified and that it's them, in fact, doing it. So with technology, we actually may have some additional advantages to ensure with biometrics and through other means like PIN and passwords that it's the patient, in fact, that's able to complete that. Um, great, thanks, uh, thanks uh, for that. Uh, another question coming in from Stuart Grant. Um, his question is, does general clinical patient conditions reduce the stickiness of devices compared to specific conditions such as uh, ALS? Um, what is the current best route to get into the medical record? Uh, so that might go to uh, Ravi. Any thoughts on how uh, general versus specific uh, medical con conditions affect uh, um, user engagement? Right. Thank you. This is Ravi. A um, couple of thoughts. So, so one of the, and I think we, we've sort of talked very briefly about this earlier. Um, is one of the things we have to address before we go to how do we get all the data incorporated is how do we address the question of silos. Uh, even within the EHR systems, there are so many different, you know, one EHR does not talk to the other. And if, if I am an ALS patient and I'm visiting my neurologist and then I'm also visiting my general practitioner and I'm visiting my physical therapist and they happen to be on three different systems, none of the data is going to be seen by the other two caregivers unless I actually physically print out paper records and take it from one appointment to the other. So there is that interoperability question that we have to address as a group and figure out how do we incentivize the entire ecosystem to, to in the going forward that the data is easily not only assimilated, but transferable and available to the patient and the caregivers in an easily interpretable fashion. The second bit we have to think about as we collect some of these ML data is in the specific case of ALS, for example, towards what purpose? Are we collecting the right data around, for example, uh, respiration? Are we collecting the right data for example, around uh, gross motor skills as we collect data about activities of daily living? And are, will this data provide us either new insights into the progression of disease or therapeutic benefit, or will this supplement the already existing clinical endpoints that the physicians are using in, in, in the shared decision-making that we all want to get to? 
So those are some of the things that we have to think about before we can say here's the data set and the device set or the app set that will give us the envelope data. So you know, as we think through this, you know, one of the things that I keep thinking about in, in, in my day-to-day in my -day job at patients like me is are we, what is the right problem? Are we solving for the right problem? Once we get to what those problems are, then the solution becomes an, an easier set to deal with. Great, and I think that Greg Pappas also joined the call, and I think Greg, you had a comment as well on Robbie's point. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, I point, Robbie. I wanted to uh, add in, you know, perhaps a more generic way that linkage between data sets is critical. Alone, there's not much mo most of these data sets of, as standalones can do. Uh, claims data for, da for, for devices, don't tell us much. Uh, EHRs don't tell us much by themselves. Uh, registries by themselves don't tell us much by themselves. M health da data. When we link them, we begin to see great utility. In, in fact, in, in fact, the the uh, the scenarios, the, the best case scenarios, or the, our prototypes for Nest are those linkage. Uh, indeed, uh, M health data coming in for patients uh, through apps have been used uh, uh, linked to registries in the orthopedic space, providing really critical information that makes uh, the data much richer and much more meaningful. So uh, you're absolutely right, the linkage is what's, linkage is, is a really critical issue. Yeah, um, great, thanks, um, thanks Greg. So another question is coming in from Pat Baird. Um, let me just, I don't know if, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. I noticed one of the slides there is a mention of patient-centered design. In usability literature, there's a concept of user-centered design, or UCD. Um, uh, Pat is wondering if this is the same concept or if PCD goes beyond the textbook UCD techniques. Um, who would, uh, maybe uh, any of our speakers want to address that question? Uh, maybe Robbie, do you have an idea on that? Right. So, um, Pat, actually, thank you for that question. That, that, that's something that uh, I think about often. Uh, so, user centered uh, design is a design concept that primarily has three foci. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, focus on the users and tasks early and throughout the design process. Um, measure empirically the, the usability during the process and design and test usability, usability iteratively, that is, um, you know, test quickly and fail quickly and move on and iterate through, through the process. So that's UCD in a nutshell. So those are the three main, main areas of UCD. Uh, Patient-centered design takes the same concepts of UCD but focus more on the healthcare aspect of it. So while you're doing user-centered design in, in, a, in a healthcare uh, framework, uh, what you're doing is applying the same principles, but with the end user in mind, uh, how do we enable the, the, the person, not necessarily a patient, it, you know, because we are talking about health, wellness, and disease, so how do we enable the end user of health and wellness to achieve their, their health and wellness goals in, in, a, in an efficient manner so that they can actually derive the right insights and, and feel engaged and become part of the process. I hope that answers the question. Um, great, uh, great, Ravi, thanks for that. So I don't see that we have any other comments on this more um, general discussion of the three different um, uh, major stakeholder groups and how to um, increase engagement. So, um, so we are going to move on to the next portion of the webinar, but I, what I would first ask is uh, if um, uh, during this conversation, if you did have comments on the um, stakeholder groups and approaches for in increasing engagement and incentivizing uh, um, uh, activity in this area, please send those comments to margolismhealth at duke.edu by July 12th.
that would be greatly appreciated. Um, at this stage, I'm going to move things over to the second half of the, um, this presentation. We're going to be talking more about the mHealth data types. Um, we've categorized them into person-reported data, task-based data, and passive sensing. Um, with that, I'll turn things over to Heather Colvin to provide some background on that. We'll also hear from um, others as well, and then we'll have another section of public feedback and engagement. So if you have comments or questions on this next section, please go ahead and start using the um, raise your hand or the chat box to start uh, sending us those comments so that we can get to them in the next section's uh, public feedback. Uh, Heather? Hi, everybody. Um, so one of the things that we started to realize was a major challenge for us moving forward was jargon, as in every situation, every group um, and has their own words and terms that they like to use for things, and so we felt like um, if we all started from a common set of what we mean when we're using certain terms, it would just expedite the process going forward because we're talking cross-disciplinary. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we tried to boil down the, the kind of three main types of data we see being generated by in-health um, technologies. Um, and one of the things we tried to do was to stay away from some of the more specific specific kind of clinical terms and incorporate them into these broader buckets that might have more meaning for um, M Health companies and for clinicians and for sponsors going forward. So we broke this up into user reported data. What is it? What people tell us about ourselves. Um, themselves, um, task-based measures, and this is measures of what people would do with um, a set, set of instructions or activities. And then there's passive sensing, those sensors where you just wear them um, um, throughout the day and they passively collect information about you. Um, and so when thinking about user-reported data, we wanted this to be clear that this is actually the user. We steered away from the idea of patient-reported data um, because at the end of the day, most people don't think of themselves as patients. Most people think of themselves as people. Um, patients are people who are in hospitals was a comment someone made to us. And so, um, and we also recognize that people move in and out of states of health. Um, you're healthy one day, the next day you may not be, um, but then you go through treatment and you're improved. And we we want to capture information about people as they move in and out of these states of health. So we specifically um, shied away from the term patient um, and instead thinking about this as in, in people who are adapting technology as users of that technology. It's a simple change, but it's something we wanted to be clear about why we chose that term. Um, and this is data that's reported by people or by caregivers of that person if they are unable to report that data. And it can include a whole swath of information. It can be questionnaires, surveys, symptom tracking. It could be um, a person uh, reported outcomes or um, patient reported outcomes, which are typically incorporated in some clinical research. Um, and it can also include patient diaries. Um, people are required, my mom has to report on what she eats on a daily basis as part of her diabetes treatment. Um, people collect this information for a variety of reasons. When I was doing triathlon training, I collected information about my exercise regime. So people in different states of health collect information for different reasons. Um, we wanted to be sure to be clear that this data was not limited to validated outcome measures. Um, patient reported outcomes measures or PROMs um, are very specifically designed um, mechanisms to collect information and measure them. We didn't want to um, exclude those. We wanted to be inclusive of other sets of information as well. And often, just as a point of context, many of these patient-reported outcome measures that have been out there for a while and are validated have been historically captured through other approaches, paper tests or in the clinician's office, phone surveys, et cetera. Um, we also wanted to um, think about the data that could be collected through different types of mHealth applications. Can we convert what has historically been done in the clinician's office um, and on, on a piece of paper to something that be, could, could be collected through an app? 
Then we started thinking about task-based measures. Um, what is it that people do if they're given a certain set of instructions? And these are typically objective measures of a person's mental and or physical ability to perform a test. Um, and this is thinking about some of the traditional clinical measures that we see, physical functionings like the six-minute walk test that Ravi and both Seth talked about earlier. This also could include cognitive functioning, um, the tests that are out there right now, but also um, physiological tests performed by the users. So this could be data that's actually actively generated by a, a glucose monitor, um, and that could be incorporated as, as one of these as well. Um, in the past, many of these measures were collected in a clinical setting within a clinical observer. But we see an opportunity, with the, if appropriately done, to transition these clinically observed measures in some cases to things that um, individuals could do themselves outside of the clinical environment. And there are some obvious opportunities here, if appropriately done, to validate that those the same level of, um, of quality of those measures, if done in the, in the home, um, could save lots of um, money in terms of clinical visits, time missed from work, um, and other things that would help patients be more involved and engaged because it's less of a burden. Um, we also think that there could be collected through, um, these things could be collected through remote sensors um, and mobile applications in combination. And then passive sensing, and we think of passive sensing in a variety of different ways, one of which are, you know, the activity monitor watch that I wear on a fairly regular basis. It could also include some of the new technologies that are coming out that, um, and new sensors that are coming out, um, bathroom mats that look at um, weight for patients with COPD or congestive heart failure. We also have a variety of other sensors that are coming out, um, and also there's a whole new field around um, looking at how um, mood can be assessed, for instance, um, based on the person's uh, use of their mobile phone. So we wanted to be, you know, we know we don't want to be stuck with the technology that we have now. We wanted to be future thinking about the technology that's coming down the pike. And so I'm going to switch over because Megan Dorr um, is going to be able to walk us through some of the examples that she has um, uh, gone through as well. So Megan, I think I'm handing you over the, the keys to the presentation. Hi everyone, this is Meg Dorr. Um, from Megan, I'm just going to ask you to speak up a little, it's hard to hear you. Maybe this is a little bit better. So my name is Meg Dorr. I work for Sage Bio Networks, which is a, a nonprofit um, think tank based out in Seattle, Washington. Um, Sage um, worked with Apple um, at, on the original release of the Research Kit apps in 2015, um, and we built um, a back-end repository for hosting um, data collected through these apps. Um, as well as developing the consenting process um, for consenting uh, people to participate in an entirely remote research study. So I'm going to be presenting some of the data from our Parkinson's Empower study. This data is actually publicly available. Um, it, uh, participants consented for its broad release. Um, and so to see these data uh, yourself, you're welcome to uh, visit uh, the SAGE website and work your way towards the data set and we'll find access to it. Hey Meg, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but um, it is very hard to hear. Um, I didn't know if you could move the phone closer to you. Thank you. All right. Let's see if this is any better. So um, the Parkinson's Impact study enrolled um, thousands of participants when it launched in March of 2015. Uh, both people with Parkinson's disease, a self-reported diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and um, people without Parkinson's disease were also invited to participate. We had uh, people consent um, to participate in the study, and then um, they immediately, we immediately started gathering data in the three buckets um, that we've described so far. So if we could move to the next slide. So we um, collected passive data. Um, we had structured activities, and we also had uh, patient-reported um, data in the form of surveys. So the surveys we used were um, the MDS and UPDRS and the PDQ-8, 
um, PROs, which are, are well known and used in clinic um, for, for people with Parkinson's disease. We had some structured activity and, it's, and also some passive measures that we gathered. And you can see here in this graph, we were looking at motor initiation, gait imbalance, hypophonia, and memory, all of which are affected in Parkinson's disease. So I'm going to be sharing with you some of the data from our um, gait imbalance um, activity. So if we could go to the next slide. So you can see we introduced, these are the actual screens from the app itself. Participants downloaded this app onto their phone and then consented themselves and then started participating. There was a tapping um, test that uh, measured motor initiation, a gait imbalance um, activity that uh, measured um, people's ability to initiate um, activity and, and their steadiness on their feet. Um, a hypophonia activity where, where participants use the microphone in their, in their smartphones um, to capture vocalization and initiation of vocalization. And then we also had a memory test, um, which um, participants liked a lot because it was like a little game for them. So the gait and balance test um, was a really interesting one when we start looking at the data. If we go to the next slide. Um, the phone has within it um, a gyroscope um, as well as an accelerometer, and so we can measure um, activity using the X, Y, and Z vectors. So the X vector going across the phone, the Y vector going up and down the phone, and then the Z vector um, going through the phone um, front to back um, and use this data to tell us about participants' activity. So if you want to see what the data actually look like, the next slide presents some of this activity. So here is um, data from a person who was doing the walking activity. You can see um, their acceleration um, and then um, their work against gravity there. So you can see them walking at fairly steady pace from second zero over to second 12. And you can see in the X and the Y and then the Z axes there. So I'll give you a second to take a look at this to see, to process this data a little bit. But you can see it's, it's pretty clean data, um, and it really can tell us a lot more, one might argue, than just clinical observation alone could about participants' steadiness on their feet, the regularity of their stepping, um, their comfort in walking. So uh, not everybody walks the same way, yeah, we don't need a Monty Python sketch to remind us of all of the silly ways that people walk, um, but certainly we saw this as well uh, with our data. So the next few slides present some of this silly walk data. This first one, um, you can see a participant was um, walking but holding the phone in their hand um, and then they stopped walking at four seconds, there you can see a stop. They put the phone into their pocket, um, button up, top down, and they started walking um, again. So you can see a difference there in the way that the phone responds, and, and you can see within this data, it's pretty clear what's actually happening um, with the participants. So all the, although the data is technically dirty, it's not a mystery to us what's happening. Because we're, we're collecting this granular data, we can understand what was going on. So it looks like the participant was holding the phone in their hands, they started the walking activity, then they probably read the direction, oh, your phone is supposed to be in your pocket. They stopped, they put their phone in their pocket, and they continued the activity and completed it successfully. The next slide uh, shows a person walking, you can see between seconds two and 15, and then not walking, and then starting to walk again. So we had vocal commands um, that the phone would give about walking, and sometimes those vocal commands were muffled by a person having the volume down on their phone or um, being hard of hearing and not hearing the phone very easily from, from its placement in their pocket. So we saw some of this as well. So any of you who work with real people in the real world understand this is pretty much par for the course. In this exploratory um, study, you know, to Seth's point about the different ways that we can use this data, we were really exploring the different ways in which people were interacting with their phones and how well they would do 
understanding directions and being able to follow them on their own. Um, we found things like making sure that directions were audible um, as participants participated in these activities, also reading levels, um, being at um, you know, the fifth grade reading level to help participants really be able to understand what we're asking them to do, um, have helped. The next slide uh, shows an interesting pattern. So um, we have here a person who's walking in you know, seconds one through about 25, um, and then they uh, take the phone out, look at their phone, and then put it back into their pocket, but they put it back in in the reverse orientation, which is why you can see this flip on the y-axis um, from being oriented downward to being oriented upward. And then one final, um, one final graph on the next slide. So if you look at the scale here, you can see the scale is, is very small compared to the other ones. Um, it looks like, uh, from what we can tell, the person uh, took their phone, they read the directions for the walking activity, uh, they placed their phone on a nearby table, and then they started the walking activity. And we can see the phone is actually jiggling on the table slightly as the participant does the walking activity um, and then comes back and picks up their phone. So, so these are some of the, the variable ways in which people in the real world have already started at interacting with their phones, doing these um, these activities. Um, with the Parkinson's Empower study, we, we found a lot of really interesting data, um, and we, of course, are happy to share this data. It's publicly available, as I said, and if anybody has questions about it, um, I'd be happy to take them. And with that, I think we're back to a question time. That's great. Thank you so much, Megan. So, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, great. Uh, so, um, thanks to um, Heather and May, uh, Megan for um, all of those uh, great comments. Um, we're going to reopen the lines uh, for the next 15 minutes to get uh, your thoughts and comments on um, on these sort of categories of uh, uh, of data um, of uh, technology types. Uh, so earlier, as I mentioned, again, please use the raise your hand feature. You can email us the comments, although if, if you can, um, either use the raise the hand feature and we'll call on you and unmute you, or you can go ahead and type your comments into the chat box if you want me to read it. Um, so let's turn to, do we have any? We don't have any. Right okay. Um, Heather, do you have any uh, comments? Yeah, actually, I would love it, Megan, if you could talk about, as part of your exploratory research into the viability of the data, if you could talk about um, kind of the, the, the population size that you're looking at and how do you deal with potentially some of this dirtier data um, when looking at larger groups of people and some of the methods, because I think one of the key things that we've been hearing is, are there really good methods out there for people to use in um, looking at this data? Yeah, um, so this is a this is a great question. You know, the focus of our initial exploratory work with Research Kit apps really was focused on this. You know, we were wondering what we would gather, if anything, um, that might be useful. Um, what we found was that um, making an app-based research study that participants could consent themselves to um, and didn't require any in-person steps really drew a lot of participants. So we had tens of thousands of people join the Parkinson's Empower study within its first 48 hours. Um, it became the largest Parkinson's study literally overnight um, as more and more people joined which is amazing and wonderful, very, very powerful platform to be able to bring the research directly to people rather than asking people to find their way into a clinic or other, other place that might be less convenient to them. So for that reason, it's very powerful. You can get huge numbers of people. Um, the data, though, as you saw, can be dirty. Um, it takes, I think, um, some greater data analysis skills. I think um, though data science is advancing just as fast as our ability to collect the data is, and we're now seeing um, 
new graduates in data science with very sophisticated approaches um, to analyzing and cleaning data. But this is certainly not something you can do using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, this is something you really do need data scientists on your team um, for. Um, also, given the volume of data, you know, I mean, you think about the dirty data that Google or Facebook or Instagram collect about people. Um, if you get enough data, um, the, the dirt sort of starts to fall away a little bit and you can start to see larger patterns. Um, although I would caution um, one of the most important things that distinguishes work like this um, from data capture in places like Facebook or Google or Instagram is the consenting process. And I think that this is one of the most critical things that we keep in mind as we think about gathering these data and using them as the FDA is proposing, is that um, people, participants, really need to understand what it is that they're handing over and um, be cognizant in what they're doing and, and what they're handing over and why um, when it comes to data collection, uh, lest we repeat um, the errors of our, of our predecessors um, in Tuskegee and, and other uh, research studies. I think informed consent is really one of the critical pieces um, to mobile health um, investigation. Thank. Go ahead. Oh, uh, great. Uh, thanks for the. Um, thanks for that. And so, um, uh, um, so I, I want to bring your attention. You know, it's, um, this work group has really been working on a simple way to think about these different technologies and to go back to the sort of the almost the framework that Heather presented, where there's like three different types of. Um, uh, well, data types that would be measurable by M Health uh, technologies. One would be user reported, where the, pa the patient themselves has to ha has to sort of um, go in and, and um, report uh, their experiences or, or manually input data. Um, the other category was task based, which measures the effort or physiology of your t ability to perform a task. And then the passive sensing type of um, technologies that uh, um, are sort of like running in the background as people do um, uh, their things. So I want to like check on the group's thoughts on this. Are there um, are these the right kinds of categories? Are there other things that the um, that the work group should be thinking about? So one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that when we were thinking about these categories, one of the key questions that came up was individuals reporting to us um, their ability to do something, confirming what they actually could do through a task-based measure, like a six-minute walk test, and then seeing what they actually do on a regular basis with the passive generation. And we think the combination of these three types of data can give you a complete picture or a more complete picture of that um, patient's um, well-being and physical health. So um, I just wanted to see if anyone had any thoughts about that. Um, and I think, Christina, do you have a, we have a so question? Do you think it's possible to encourage secure data exchange between healthcare organizations for analytical, um, and I missed that last word and it's not coming through, um, but presumably for analytical um, evaluations? So of course this question to maybe Seth and to Meg, um, I think Seth is still on the line. Um, do you think it's possible to, to make these types of arrangements? Meg, I don't know if you've had an experience with this. Um, so right now the Precision Medicine Initiative, the All of Us Research Program is moving in this direction. Um, part of the All of Us Research Program will be um, sensor-based um, measurements that participants will be able to um, share with the All of Us Research Program, which then would be married with a whole host of data types, including electronic health records um, and, and other data about their health, um, claims data and so forth. Um, and so, again, um, the, the devil is in the detail of how to create data um, that's sufficiently well structured that it can be married fairly easily into these other data types. Um, but certainly, um, as one of our earlier speakers said, the real power comes when we start marrying um, diverse data types together to get a complete picture of a person's health. Again, um, making sure that people 
understand the level of data integration that's happening, um, the view that people are getting on their lives, researchers get, are getting on their lives, is really important um, and, can't, and can't be understated in how um, important it is to be transparent with those data linkages. And I think we have another question. Yeah, um, another question um, from Pat Baird. Um, I have a generic question for the panelists. What worries you the most about this field? I think the opportunities are great and I truly appreciate their research, but much of my time has been spent on risk management. So I'm interested in how to prevent things from going wrong. Any thoughts from the group? I'm going to actually, there's two people I think who might be good to answer this. First, I'd like to put it back to Meg, because I think, Meg, one of the first things that you mentioned was the, the need for updating informed consent and making it usable, and then maybe also ask Ravi to, to weigh in after Meg's comment. And Greg wants to also like to weigh in. Let's okay. talk to that. So, Meg, could you speak a little bit about some of the informed consent issues and maybe how that may address some of the risk issues? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think that um, uh, traditional informed consent um, and in-person interaction around informed consent has often been really about a legal document, certainly in recent years, um, and not really about ensuring that participants are understanding what it is they're actually being asked to do and what it is they're handing over um, to the research team. And when we think about these mHealth-based um, data measurements that we can gather, um, we really need participants to understand a little bit more sophisticatedly um, what can be measured by their phone, what, can be, what we can gather, and how we would be using it. And so creating a transparent um, and easily understood um, informed consent process which allows for uh, reflection by the participant, self-navigation by the participant, um, allows for time for questions and, and reflection, I think is absolutely essential. Um, also establishing um, very clear policies when it comes to what will be tracked when and why um, is important from the research side. So um, we found in the Parkinson's Empower study that participants were very willing to share their data broadly with researchers around the world. Um, they wanted certain protections in place um, when it came to anonymizing their data. We also found that participants were much um, more willing to do passive measurements of their, of their activity than to do um, surveys. For example, we found uh, dozens more, um, like an order of magnitude more um, tasks were done then surveys were answered. And so um, recognizing the type of data that you're going to be getting from people allows you then to shift the focus of your informed consent um, interaction via phone to really say, you know, we know you're going to be giving us this data. This is the type of data it's going to be, and this is what we're going to do with it. Um, but again, making it understandable, making it a covenant between researchers and participants, I think, is essential. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Ravi, do you have some uh, thoughts on that too? Yes, um, so I, actually I want to echo what Megan just said. Um, create that covenant of trust between the, the, the participants, the patients, the public, and, and the research community, um, because that is what w is, is, the, is the engine that will drive this forward. Uh, and we all as a community have to be very cognizant of that. The other two things that I think past question, what are the, what are the things that keep you awake at night? Um, the, the, the other two things are that I think about, um, worry about a lot, um, is data security. I mean, we, we, we would all love to collect this high density, longitudinal, passive data from patients. But in a part of this trust covenant that, that we all, we, we are talking about now is how do we ensure that the data we collect from, from, from our patients, our, our, the people, is properly secured, protected, and the privacy is maintained and the data inde integrity is assured. The second bit, which coming from genomics is a hard lesson I learned and I want us to all be thinking about this in, in mHealth, is not to over-promise and under-deliver. I mean, there's a huge, 
huge potential in M health, and we should carefully think through this entire process as we go along from where we are now in 2017 to 2024 is not just collect data, but how do we transform that data into knowledge and actionable insights that will enable the patient community and the, and the people who are using mHealth data to move forward in a meaningful fashion so that we do ultimately create the sustainable ecosystem. Great, thank you so much for that comment. Um, Greg Pappas? Ravi said exactly what I was gonna say, managing expectations. Nest has great potential, real world evidence has great potential. It's gonna take a long time, we've got a lot of work to do, so uh, we shouldn't um, have too much, too, too much um, uh, too many expectations up front. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Greg, and thanks to all of you. Again, if um, after this uh, this webinar, if you have further comments or uh, suggestions, again, please email uh, margolismhealth at duke.edu. Um, we're going to um, uh, go ahead and turn things over to, um, to Heather to talk about next steps and action plan uh, contents after, after uh, 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 this webinar. So Heather. Great, thank you all for participating. This has been really helpful for us. And what we're really trying to do is create a forum for you to engage with us and let us know your thoughts. Um, you know, we have a great working group with uh, multidisciplinary uh, backgrounds, but we know that there's a much broader universe of people who are working in this field. And so um, please see this as an opportunity to contact us um, via the information that Greg just gave. Um, with the Margolis website, but I also want um, you to know that you can just drop us an email. Uh, we're happy to take any feedback and comments and incorporate that um, into the information that the working group has in its um, discussions. So one of the things that I wanted to just talk through is what's next? What are we doing? Um, so the plan is, is that the working group is going to take its ongoing research on top of the feedback from this webinar um, and start um, putting paper to pen. Um, right now we have an outline, but we want to start building that out in a more meaningful way to, um, um, to develop an action plan. And we're specifically calling it an action plan because we want it to be real and tangible with next steps. Um, and so thinking about that, like I said, we've talked through kind of the first group of these topics, why we think this is important, is the role that mHealth could play in providing a unique set of data that would be hard to get in other places um, to NEST to support the evaluation of medical devices. Um, we also want to get your thoughts about the different types of mHealth technologies that you know are coming down the pike that we may not be aware of, um, so that we can be thinking about not just what's available now, but what's coming forward in the future. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about our three big bucket issues, user engagement, researcher needs, and health company incentives. We think that, as Robbie said, this is a three-legged stool and we have to address all three of these sets of issues in order to make the vision of making mHealth a viable data source for medical device evaluation feasible. Um, one of the things I do want to touch on is it came up in several places, I think with Pat Bard's questions around kind of the risk issues, is that we are looking at the broader ecosystem that is facing technology right now. Um, we will be touching on some of the work that's going on by other groups. Um, while technically not kind of in scope for this project, we do think it's important for us to address things um, that are critical moving forward, and that being informed consent, thinking about the work that's going on more broadly with data linkages and interoperability, going to Joe Dross's comments about how he, Mercy, and others are trying to put that data forward so that it can actually inform clinicians and that they can have informed shared decision-making with their patients. Um, we also are going to continue our work in thinking about fit for purpose. Where does mHealth fit into the broader evidence generation enterprise? How does it work with clinical information, with registries, and other sources of data? But we are hoping to do this with the idea that we will come up with some recommendations about next steps, not just for FDA, not just for mHealth developers or for researchers, but for the broader ecosystem in general. What can we as a community do going forward to advance the application of these possible technologies and to make it a real viable source. We want to get to the vision of that 2024 um, world. 
So we will be um, collecting the information from this public comment period. Um, please, please, please get it to us before July 12th. Um, 12th. Um, we have to pull this all together um, for the working group to consider. So um, please send us your comments and feedback. Um, I wanted to let you know that all the webinar slides and a recording of the webinar will be available up on the Duke Margolis website within the next 48 hours. So if you want to go and refer back to some of the materials or have questions, um, they will be available on our website. We plan, um, mark your calendars, save the date. Uh, we want to have a public release of the action plan um, on September 15th, and that is scheduled for 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to have in-person attendance as well as a webcast of that release, and we will walk through kind of the action plan and the next steps going forward. Um, and any questions that you have, all the details of this will be posted on the Duke Margolis website um, coming forward, and registration should be open soon. Um, if you are interested in keeping up to date with the activities of not just this program, but of the other work at Duke Margolis, please um, follow the link to healthpolicy.duke.edu slash newsletter, where we send out updates about our activities. We won't spam you, we promise. We only send them out once a month, and we try to keep them as concise and on target as possible so that you know what we're working on um, in this world. So thank you all. Um, I, uh, we really appreciate your feedback, and we really appreciate the hard work of all the working group members, and particularly those working group members who um, were willing to participate and, and be panelists in today's call. Um, thank you so much. Have a great evening, and I think we have finished the webinar. Goodbye, and we'll talk to you all soon. Look forward to getting your comments.